Yeah, coach, just um, overall kind of your early scouting report on Mississippi State, just what you guys are looking for from them. Yeah, Christina, I think, you know, the biggest thing with Mississippi State, you, you've got to be prepared for physicality. Um, and this is a team that loves to uh, create steals. They average 10 steals a game. It's a uh, high gamble team defensively. They jump in passing lanes. Um, you know, the, the, the pace of play, they try to control the pace of play. Um, it's a paint game. You've got to be able to defensively defend the paint, especially uh, Tulu Smith inside, who's averaging 15 points per game and, uh, in, not in, in this, on the year and 13 in conference play. You know, perimeter-wise, they have Deshaun Davis, number 10, uh, Oregon State transfer who can make threes, um, high assist player, and then, and then Shaquille. Uh, more an NC State transfer lefty can shoot the ball playing really well of late and then they have some really athletic wings with 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 great size and Cam Matthews number four and Tyler Stevenson number 14 and DJ Jeffries number zero so um, and then two big guys inside and two Lou Smith number one and McNair who played at New Mexico State last year and we played you know against him in the NCAA tournament number 13 so boxing out, keeping them off the offensive glass, getting a shot on goal, uh, not allowing their steal game or their defensive anticipation to get out and create uh, transition baskets for them. Those will be some of the keys, uh, you know, to Saturday's game. And then I had a question about Devo. I know we've talked a lot about how he's been getting in the gym early and, you know, putting extra work into his shooting, but... What was it that kind of flipped for him? Was that a result of a conversation he had with you or the staff or just kind of a self-motivated? No, I mean, you know, his shooting, you know, I would credit everything to, you know, to him, to, to his own work ethic. I mean, I have, I've only really talked to him about, um, you know, two of his fingers following through into the rim, you know, kind of noticed that, that at times maybe his, his first two fingers would, you know, would, would kind of follow through, not into the, into the rim, but he's, I mean, even, even in Lexington, I was in the weight room and he shows up and he dragged Kamani in there. I mean, it's just not often that you have a guy that's playing 40 minutes a night that's coming in to lift weights at eight in the morning, you know, on a 9 PM tip off. So his, his work ethic's been great. His leadership's been great. I thought his on-court maturity at Kentucky was at a was at an all-time high level. You know, he came off a game where he was four for nine from three. Um, he only took two threes. I thought his shot selection was incredible. Uh, we needed him to be a facilitator based on how we wanted to attack Kentucky in pick and rolls. And he understood that his role on that given night was to be a little bit more of a facilitator. Uh, and he did it, and he did it at a high level. Coach, Curtis. I just wanted to piggyback off of Christina's question there. We broke down Devo's numbers from the first six games of the season to the last five, and they are very similar. Is there a number on the stat sheet that really pops off to you with Devo in this second half of the season? Because he seems like a whole new player. No, I, I think he's, I think he's, you know, understands that, you know, we have a, a limited amount of games, and so there's a little bit more heightened um importance to every game um but, but he's doing what the game calls upon i talked about his assist at at south carolina we needed his perimeter shooting um before south carolina we really needed him to to do a great job of of of, of defending star players so what i'm most impressed with with devo is just his ability to do what the game on that night um asks him to do so He's had many different roles for us, that's for sure. Curtis? Coach, even at, at this point of the season, you're still experiencing new things with this team. I, I guess is the next challenge for this group to just kind of overcome an emotional road win like last night and, and be able to avoid any sort of letdown this weekend? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the good thing is that, that um, you know, it's, it's a Tuesday and um, – you know, it's, 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 we still have, you know, Wednesday and, um, you know, where they're, they're really not doing anything. 
Thursday we'll have a good practice. Friday we should have a good practice. We because it's a you know the tips at five, we will be able to have a shoot around on Saturday. So I, I think there's plenty of time to uh, to get over. Um, you know, I don't. It's not just that that we won the game at Kentucky. It's also the fact that you know we have a winning streak going, just like Kentucky had a winning streak going. And you know, once you get over four or five wins, you just can never get comfortable with that, and you have to understand how hard it is to win. And there's a really good chance that 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 Mississippi State's going to come in here on their own winning streak. I mean, they won their big 12 challenge game against a really, really good team. They've got a couple wins in league. They play a home game tonight. So, you know, they're going to come in here with, with, with a great deal of momentum as well. And I, I guess, has there been any change of status or, or progress of note with Nick? Yeah. Nick's uh, you know, he has uh, practiced the last few days with us. Um, obviously he did not go on the road trip so that he could continue to stay back here and work on his conditioning. Um, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're optimistic that, uh, and hopeful that Nick will be able to play sometime here in the near future. Hutch. Yeah, coach, y'all had that really tough game against New Mexico state in the NCAA tournament and coach Jans. I'm curious if you, even though this is year one for him at Mississippi state, are you kind of seeing his fingerprints on this team? Yeah, I think that all the new coaches, you know, in our league, we're seeing, you know, a, a, a style and identity start to be formed. It's hard to do it in your first year, but coach Jans did, they, they, they were incredible in non-conference play. Um, and then much like us, there was a little bit of a struggle early in conference. And now, like I mentioned, uh, of late, they've been playing great basketball. Um, they're tough. They're physical. Uh, they, they create grinded out games. They're very well coached. Uh, they're defense oriented. Um, they're going to throw the ball inside uh, six to nine times to, to, to Tulu Smith on, on straight post-ups. And they're great offensive rebounding team. So a lot of similarities, for sure, from what we saw um, from New Mexico State. You mentioned they're playing a lot better of late. Was there something that changed for them, something that seems to be working better now and maybe earlier in the SEC play? No, I, I mean, I just think, you know, there's, there's ebbs and flows throughout the course of the season. But uh, more number three, is, is playing um, better of late, for sure. And, and um you know, Smith is, I mean, he's just a hard, hard cover because he's a wide body. He's a guy that draws free throws attempted. Uh, he, he, you know, they, they, they do such a great job creating steals. And, and it's really hard to create a defense <laughs> when there's live ball turnovers. I mean, it's hard to come up with a game plan for a team that's a high steal, high gamble uh, team. And so getting a shot on goal becomes paramount, not uh, trying to eliminate uh, live ball turnovers is extremely important as well. Scotty? Yeah, Eric, Mikel has, you know, kind of emerged since you guys, you know, got on your your SEC win streak. I'm, I'm curious what he's done, you know, maybe behind the scenes or, or whatever to gain the staff's trust, it, it, you know, like it seems like he has. He's been really locked in on the, on the scouting report. Um, you know, pre-practice and post-practice here is really important. Um, you know, last night was by far his best finishing game. Um, you know, when you look at his numbers from the field, uh, he had a fabulous rim run um, with a high degree of difficulty pass to catch on the run. He was able to, to not only catch the ball, gather himself, uh, finish. Um, he hit a mid-range shot. Um, but his, I think his, his defensive physicality, his defense rim protection, uh, really important against some of these teams of late that we've played. Obviously, when, when you when you think about Texas A&M, you think about their offensive rebounding, and you think about Coleman and Marble inside. So it made sense for uh, Mikel to have a big role. And then you think about uh, Kentucky's front line and how you're going to defend and who's going to be primarily assigned to Oscar Toshibwe. Kel made perfect sense on that. And now certainly coming into Mississippi State, 
um, you know, the post-up game, especially if number one, Tulu Smith, is of the highest importance to us, uh, along with when McNair comes in, um, trying to try to uh, eliminate uh, post-ups of both those two interior players. And then we've got a defensive rebound with guys like DJ Jeffries and Cam Matthews. And what have your impressions been of, of Jordan of late? I think you mentioned on Saturday that you'd been, you know, you'd seen good growth from him. What what is that growth entailed exactly to, in your opinion? Yeah, I think whether a player starts or comes off the bench, you want that player to uh, be mentally engaged, be able to come in and have an impact right when he checks in, uh, get into the flow of the game offensively, but make an impact on the boards, make an impact, um, running the floor, make an impact defensively. And certainly we feel like Jordan has done that. Um, you know, and even, you know, coming off the bench, my thought process was maybe it would help him stay out of foul trouble a little bit. Um, although we brought him off the bench last night and, and, and there was still a little bit of, of foul, uh, issues, but he's, uh, I think he keeps getting better and better. Um, and, and when he plays with the energy that we've seen of late, he really, really impacts the game on three levels, offensively, defensively, and then on the backboards, both offensive rebounding and defensive rebounding. Now, Bob? Le- less sorry, thing, go ahead, buddy. Yeah, last thing, if you don't mind. I think you guys' offensive numbers, whether coming out in the second half on that first possession or coming out of a timeout are, are pretty good this year, I think, especially of late, what, just what, what do you maybe attribute that to and, and how much pride do you, do you guys take in that? Yeah, I mean, I think we take, you know, we try to take a lot of pride in our opening play of the game. Um, you know, we try to r- run a play that we've never run before to start every game, um, a new set. Um, and then, you know, we feel like it's important to get a good shot uh, from a shot selection standpoint. Uh, to start the second half, whether you have the ball to start or your first offensive possession after a defense possession in the second half. And then certainly after timeouts, you know, you want to try to get a defensive stop because you know that if the other team has the ball, that that they're trying to come up with a, a possession that you s- steal, so to speak. And then offensively, we, we want to try to do the same thing and try to score off maybe a wrinkle that uh, you know, that, that the opposition hasn't seen. Bob? Uh, hey, Eric. Hey, this is a question I was asking for Nate. I wanted to ask before I forget. Um, he wanted to know what you thought about the development of the Twins. And you've already obviously talked about Mikel, but is there anything you want to add about how Mikel's been playing? No, you know, I mean, Mikel's done a great job defensively. I mean, right now in the last few games, I mean, his shot blocks per minute is is through the roof. Uh, Makai, those two guys together, uh, just as we talked about prior to the Alabama game, I thought those those two guys gave us a physical presence together at their size, at their weight, uh, with their with their physicality. Um, you know, so I, I mean, I, they've done both of them have done a, a really good job uh, defensively and rebounding and, and allowing us not to have to double team uh, the post. Uh, because they've been single coveraging guys that are star players on opposing teams. And then I know how intense you are with preparation, short turnaround from Carolina, Kentucky. I found it interesting y'all went to the horse farm. Um, was, was that a spur of the moment thing? Was that planned? And do you think that was maybe just that was good to give you and your staff guys a little bit of a mental break when you're when, when you're grinding so hard, probably? Yeah, that was all Riley Hall's idea, but um, I mean, there was only so much more we could talk about. We had enough mini film sessions and, um, you know, just like whether it's an NCAA tournament or whatever, we, you know, I mean, I think it's always good to be able to take advantage of, you know, whether it's a couple guys on staff, whether it's the players, whether it's, you know, support staff to be able to step away from basketball for a short time frame. Was it just the, the staff or did you take the team or? No, there was no players involved. I promise you that. Okay. And very few staff. Yeah. How how long were you out there and kind of what'd you do um, maybe to re- recharge a little bit or whatever? Just get outside. That was it. It wasn't long at all. Okay. You didn't feed them any candy or anything, apple or something. That's kind of fun to do with racehorses. I've done that. <laughs> um, 
And then um, offensively, you know, Anthony was talking about how on the radio last night, you guys took advantage of some of their mismatches. And I think he said you ran the same pick and roll play nine times. He, uh, we weren't sure if it was sudden set or sunset, but maybe uh, how effective was your pick and roll? And what, what, what's that play he was talking about uh, called? And have you ever run it nine times in a row like that? Uh, yeah, the play call is Suns. If if I'm if I'm referring to what I think, Av, and it's a it's a play that Mike D'Antone ran, um, you know, with Stoudemire and 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 Nash. Um, yeah, just a middle pick and roll with some different um, options on the on the backside um, that you could do with the screen setter, um, and I, you know we executed it really well. We had really good spacing. Um, I don't, I, I didn't know we ran it nine straight times, but that wouldn't surprise me. I, you know, I mean, one of the things that you learn coaching at the NBA level is, is if a play works, you know, you, you, you probably want to go to it over and over and over and over and over and over and over. Um, so that was a, a heavily um, utilized set for us yesterday, for sure. Jerry Stackhouse has some interesting before you guys played them. He was talking to me there in Nashville, and he said, you know, a lot of college coaches, they run their offense, and, you know, it's continuation, and whoever find, gets an open look, but the, you have an NBA philosophy, obviously, and basically figuring out a mismatch of going after you. He basically said, hey, if, if, if somebody's going after you, that means they think you're a lousy defensive player, <laughs> but um, maybe, maybe, I don't you don't want to call out guys on the other team, but um, maybe you could expand a little bit on your philosophy of, of find, you know, scouting finding mismatches and then exploiting those in the game when the time comes yeah i mean it it, it, it this is in re no regards to any particular opponent but uh certainly you want to try to i mean the way that we look at it is uh line up you know one through five uh defenders you line up your one through five offensive players and if uh if your second best offensive player is being car guarded by their fourth or fifth best defender, then that's a better matchup maybe than going with your top offensive player against the opponent's top defender. Um, and so it's, it's important, like in our pick and roll situations, uh, it might be important who the ball handler is or who's guarding the ball handler, just as importantly, who's guarding the screen setter. And then the third piece to that is, when you do roll to the rim with your screen setter, who is the tag guy for the opposition? Oftentimes you want a guard to be the tag guy uh, on the roll with your biggest player. So where you place that third defender becomes extremely important. Um, and those are some of the things that you can do after timeouts or, or going into a game if you can anticipate a certain matchup. So I don't know, Bob, if, if that – if that answers semi what you were looking for. Yeah, it's, it sounds pretty technical. I think that's why you're coaching. I'm not. Um, and, and then uh, you guys had 20 fast break points last night. I think that was your second most and the most in a road game. Uh, maybe keeping with the thoroughbred theme. Did you, did, did you did you use thoroughbred in your pregame at all? You know, being in racing country and just the way you guys got out and really raced, you know, kind of like uh, racehorses, you know, the Arkansas Derby maybe or something. We, we did have a theme um, of the Kentucky Derby for sure. Um, it was taped. I don't know if it'll be out on social media or not. It will be out on social media at some point. I don't know if it'll be out in the next few days or in the summer, but it will be out at some point. Um, but, but it was more just the, how hard it is for a horse to get into the Kentucky Derby and then how hard it is for a team to win on the road, to win in a, in a place like Rupp, and then the significance of what a Kentucky Derby winner when he wins and the significance of us winning a big game. So there was a little bit of parallel, Bob. Yeah. You, you ever been to Delmar? Sure you, your, your analogy was much better, Bob, okay. much better. If I, if I knew the fast break points were going to go that way, I certainly would have used your analogy. It was way – craftier than what i came up with yeah well you you look you look 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 like you had the thoroughbreds i was just curious you know delmar i've been there a couple of times Is, have you ever been to delmar out there in la jolla i've been to delmar more than enough times i don't know what's going on i know nothing about horse racing but 
anybody that's been to Del Mar knows certain days, certain nights, whatever. It's kind of the place to be. So, yes, I have been to the Del Mar racetrack. Yeah, where we're, 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 we're the surf meets the turf, right? And that, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's, I, I actually I went with uh, Mike Pegram, a yeah, big that, horse guy as well. That's right. That's why it's well, one more thing about, about Walsh. You know, he he's been such a good defensive player. So all you year. don't want to keep talking about horses? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to, I got my horse pen here from I got this at Churchill a while back, but <laughs> taking notes with it. Uh, but, um, you know, Jordan went through a real tough shooting stretch. I think he was one for 17 on threes at one point, and he's really bounced back from that. A lot of times young guys, even if they're ultra talented like he is, they kind of get into a funk and it's hard to get them out. What do you think about the way he handled that for a young guy and kind of what, what got him back uh, to being productive on offense? Yeah, I, th I think his teammates, the coaching staff, everybody wanted him to, you know, to keep shooting. Like, you know, if a player's wide open and he doesn't take a shot, it hurts your offense. It hurts your spacing. And then I thought he did a great job. He's, he's done a, he's really mixed up his game instead of uh, floating on the perimeter. He's been offensive rebounding much better. Um, he's been attacking the rim off the bounce and he's kind of an X factor for us. When, when Jordan plays really well, uh, we become a much, much better team on both sides of the ball. And, and he had started so much. And sometimes guys, especially when they're, you know, McDonald's all Americans, they don't like coming off the bench, but he seems like he's adjusted fine. Did you, did you have a little sit down with him and say, Hey, I want to bring you off the bench. Maybe take a little pressure off you. Or how did you work that with him? No, I just kind of went into practice and said, this is the lineup we're going with tonight. Um, you know, I think that your suggestion, Bob, is is more along the lines of what my wife wanted me to do is, is explain what was going on. But um, much like philosophically, uh, we tend to run NBA sets and and play all man to man like the NBA. I, I kind of handled the substitution or the role um, on on that different starters I just kind of handle it like I would in the NBA where just kind of went in and said this is this is what we're doing tonight and it, nothing's set in stone either um on starting lineups moving forward it, it really isn't I mean it's it's going to be based on matchups how we're playing and how guys coming off the bench are playing and um so certainly um in regards to this starting lineup it's it's still in flux so to speak and but how how do you think Jordan handled that? Come ten up. out of ten, Bob. He was awesome. I mean, that's why he's playing well. Well, you know, if you don't handle it well and and you um, feel sorry for yourself, or uh, you know, it's, it 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 only works out when guys handle things the right way and say, hey, you know, if this is what the coaching staff thinks is the best team thing to help our team win, and then I accept. My role, I might not be happy with my role, but I accept it and I go out and play as hard as I can. And I mean, he played 30 some minutes, I think, at South Carolina. So whether he started or didn't and last night he would have played equally that amount if he hadn't gotten in foul trouble, probably in the first half. You, you, you mentioned you want to talk about horses some more. Well, well, did, did Riley just come to you and say, hey, coach, let's go out to a horse farm, you know, take a little break. And you're like, what? Or uh, how, how did that manifest itself? Well, we have, we have a horse guy on staff named Anthony Ruda. He's completely <laughs> obsessed with horses. And uh, I, all I know is we were in my room um, after shoot around. And all of a sudden I started hearing about horse farms and Riley got an email or a DM and Ruda is talking about whatever. So sometimes you just go along with whatever the crowd says. You know, Ke uh, Keeneland's out there. That's a real old traditional track. They they don't even have a PA system. It's just like 1800s or something. You have way more knowledge than I do, Bob. <laughs> I grew up in San Diego. Other than Del Mar, I don't know too much about horses. And, and you made it You made it into the Arkansas Derby really last night. Did, did, do you think that? You made it to the Arkansas Derby instead of the Kentucky Derby? You, you could say that. You can use it, Bob. <laughs> okay. 